All right. So hi. So I'm I'm Dana Robinson, the director of software engineering, as you know, our regulars know. Um, and I don't really have a, a, a specific plan for today because we're going to release HTML5 114 and we're going to create the branch on Thursday and then we plan to release it next Friday. So um, so that's coming. Uh, it seems to be going fine. Right, We're just trying to fix a couple of last minute issues that, you know, just last minute tidying and stuff. So no big changes from 113.3. No new big features, just some cleanup fixing random small vol air issues and other things, some warnings, stuff like that. I think very exciting. So, so that's what's new in HDF5 land is mostly just getting ready for the HDF5 114 release. And then I'm going to be very, very, very excited because after we recreate that branch, that begins HDF5 2.0. It'll be labeled 115 with the future version being 116. We'll do the semantic versioning stuff later. But but yeah, that's where we can start making making the real changes. So yeah, and as a reminder, right? Like we have uh, in January and in February, we're going to be deprecating. Or I'm sorry, it would be stop ending the the one eight and one twelve lines. So we'll have final releases of those. The one twelve line line as a reminder is being ended early because the vol layer is incompatible. We had to make a lot of changes for 114, and so we're not going to maintain that at all. And so since the vol layer is incompatible, there's no reason to have a 112 since 114 is kind of a superset of it. And and yeah, so, so both of those are going away um, early in 2023. And then we'll have releases for 110 and uh, another point release of 114 sometime later in the year, probably 110 earlier in the spring. 114, when we do that, will be feature-driven. There may be some, some improvements coming um, in shorter order than we thought. So we may have some, some new stuff that comes out in, in the March-April timeline. We'll see. But that's what we have coming for releases. Um, I don't think there's really a whole lot else going on in HDF5 land right now. Does anybody have any questions, issues? Oh, Elena. Oh, you want to talk uh, about your stuff too at all? Your 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 threading issues. What are your plans to merge with the swimmer? I'm I'm hoping to do that in one fourteen one. One fourteen one. So mm -hmm. Six months, like in summer. Yeah, I probably well. It depends on when one fourteen one comes out, right? Like if it comes out earlier. I mean, right now the, the what, what we would lack is is actual like funding to to work on it, right? If it needs significant work, we have to do it under SE and the support of sustaining engineering. And there's only so much time and availability for that. So we have to kind of figure out how we're gonna fit that in around other projects and work that we have to do. So that, that's, that's of course tricky, um, but we'll see. I would like to get that in. Um, and I would like to get that in early next year. And what we have now does not require any file format changes or anything else like that. Right, so there's nothing that it doesn't require bumping the um, the version, so we can release it as one fourteen one. But and Quincy had the idea of potentially doing, you know, there's this stuff under the hood that does all this like this tick stuff to see like you know how long is it before we have to refresh things and stuff like that. And and Quincy thought about actually doing that as a as a vol layer that we would add in there that the that would be like a VFD swimmer vol. And that would remove a lot of complexity from the library and put it into one spot. And so that's something that I wanted to have time. I've just been so busy. I haven't had time to sit down and investigate that. That's something well, that let, let's let's talk about it. Let's yeah. mm -hmm. I mean it, yeah. people can, because it's just it, you know, it, it says VFD swimmer on the tin, but it's not just in the VFD layer. It adds non-trivial stuff overhead to other parts of the library that were not well vetted before. We were before a video basically shut you, down. You mean, you mean from VFD swimmer overhead? VFD swimmer. There's a lot of stuff that goes into the H5F layer, right? There's a lot of stuff that it's there's there's non-trivial. It's not like you just add it in and it's just something that sits underneath. There's significant. It touches lots of the whole metadata cache was rewritten to support it, and it's significantly not the metadata cache. Um, the page buffering. Page buffering was well, a page, a page buffering uh, probably will be rewritten because it should be combined for many other features. Mm -hmm. So we applied uh, for a um, recovery tool that will be based on VFD Swimmer. So if we get oh. funding, then we'll be able to help. Uh, but really, the idea will be is to 
uh, if recovery tool is available, then it should be easy to um, to enable swimmer, right? Right? Uh, because this is how, of course, metadata caches, um, uh, metadata files are created, and then recovery tool will be based on that. Yeah, but you're funding the availability. Let's talk. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll know in January third if this is funded. Yeah. Well, one of the things I, I thought about also doing is like, I mean, there, there's like, there's also there's still some stuff that's in VFD Swimmer that potentially could come in, kind of independently. Before, you know, Acadio shut down, I did move most of the things that had been tweaked and fixed and improved in in, in under that project it back into the main library. So that was basically mm -hmm. ready for it to come in and for it to be a minimal set. But we mm -hmm. potentially could. I mean, John made a bunch of uh, page buffering improvements, and so potentially we can pull out just the VFD Swimmer stuff bring in the code that he has that's not VFD Swimmer and have an improved page buffer. That's not exposed at any level outside the library. So, so remember, page buffer is also needed for to improve parallel performance, right? Mm -hmm. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So, and he has an idea as how it could be done and it can be very useful. The page buffer is now he re-implemented it for VFD Swimmer. So right. it mm -hmm. really, uh, so it should be reconsidered how it's done. It's one point. And the second point is that we have to be very careful with wall layer. Uh, if we want to do multi-threading, so it's com it's coming. So he did a lot of analysis of wall layer, and there is a document already available in our GitHub. But we'll publish it when we're done with the project. We'll publish, and um, he will start implementation pretty soon, uh, like in in a week or two. But it will be probably only wall connector just to try them. But he found very interesting things, and uh, biggest finding is that it's doable. Uh, mm -hmm. And there will be some good library restructuring that uh, can be done if we are funded. So let's I, see. I think the idea for for a vol connector would be for it to be a pass through vol connector, right? Where it's just so it's, it'd be, it wouldn't really change the vol. It is. Um, right? it, it, is it is not pass through. It is hybrid actually because it goes through. It makes calls to native vol, right? Then mm -hmm. it returns and it goes. And then it can go to VFD, which should be made multi-threaded for subfiling. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, remember, subfiling was not finished because multi-threading was not in VFD layer, and it will benefit a lot. Or it can go directly. So once again, let's wait. What will happen? Oh, subfiling is, is finished, right? It's in the library. <laughs> but, I mean, like maybe there's an implementation that people know about. Where it's but different. essentially, yeah. it's not done up to design because uh, VFD layer should be multi-threaded. And yeah. one of the work from Argon will benefit. It is, uh, do you remember they have topology where VFD, where yeah. they can, and it once again, it needs um, a multi-threaded VFD layer. Mm. Okay. So keep our fingers crossed, maybe we'll get funding. And I spent all last seven months writing all kind of, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what will happen cool. if we can get uh, funding for uh, this work. It will be nice because it's doable. It's really doable, and there is a path to better HDF5 library. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that I thought about doing, like kind of in January, just on, under my own steam, is to just kind of take the VFD swimmer page buffer out and just and move that in, and then just alert John to come take a peek at it. Um, to see what to see what he thinks of it, because I mean, it it, it seemed to me that it, it wouldn't be too hard to to separate the two. And I asked him about it. He was like, "Ah, it'd be a bunch of work, and we're just going to merge VFD Swimmer anyway." But if VFD Swimmer is going to take a little bit longer, like we can put the page buffering stuff in there, and then that may be able to evolve the, independently with the parallel stuff. The problem is that people waiting for VFD Swimmer, they need it, and uh, you know. All synchrotron community waiting for you. Oh yeah, I, I talked about I talked to Eater actually that the thing, and they said that they were just kind of optional for them. So, but I mean, yeah, people do yeah. would like to have that. The, the diamond light sources, they they using Swimmer, so it is, uh, and who knows who else is using Swimmer? We need just just remove it, and you'll find out who's using it. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, because that's easy, right? Just remove Swimmer from the metadata cache. That's not a problem at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that, that's one of the things that's going to be a little awkward is we're going to have potentially two versions of, of Swimmer. And then what do we do for people who created application, create application systems that, that use legacy Swimmer? We kind of want to keep that around for them, right? So no, do we, do we do keep that going need. forward? Do we? I don't know. My understanding was that you do not need because API is the same. 
API is the same. You didn't change the programming model. Yeah, but like there's still, I think the shape. Well, yeah. No, it's uh, it should be at least it was the goal, unless they change it, but it was the goal. So no changes to APIs and no need for uh start swimmer uh APIs. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like it's like stuff like that would just be kind of a stub. Right. It simplifies, yeah. but okay. Yeah. Didn't want to hijack, sorry. I don't know. I, mean, it's not, I, I don't I didn't have really an agenda today except to tell people that that the the new release is coming and we're working right now at preparing for it. I mean, I feel like this one is going to go fairly, I mean, maybe I'm sure at, as we change the version numbers, right, there'll be like a day of hiccups over that. But all this stuff has been fairly well tested on EZP systems, on a wide variety of systems. We've greatly expanded the GitHub testing during this like past year. So I'm not too worried that we're going to have any surprises as we expand our testing out and get ready for the release. Should be a pretty straightforward process. And we have a lot of practice. We've released like so many things in the past 12 months, right? Like we're, we're getting pretty good at it's still not as automated as, as I'd like, but we're, we're pretty good at, at releasing software now. I would say in the past 25 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, just in the past year, right? We've like released how many 113 releases, right? So this is just another, it's like 113.4, just has a different number. And it's the same as the 113.3 release. We're not adding, like, if this were, if there were a new feature that were coming in, that I'd be more concerned. But th this is something that people have been pretty actively testing for months. Mm -hmm. Do we want to talk about, there was a question on the forum about a pass-through wall, getting the data set layout information. Um, <sighs> Let's see. Yeah, actually, it is uh, interesting. Uh, so, if you uh, saw that presentation, so what Blue Brain uh, people did, they used HDF5 APIs and they used page allocation and page buffering. So, this, in theory, they have um, metadata uh, at least in the pages, so and they are in the memory, in memory. And what happened when they uh, read uh, metadata information trying to find layout, shape, sizes of the data sets compared to reading with one thread and parsing JSON file with the same information. It was order of magnitude more uh, performance hit. So, and it's kind of puzzling because where HD5 spends time, it's all in memory. Does it spend time in decoding this information? So having this information decoded once and storing something will definitely be big win for applications, performance-wise. And we need to, we need to look. Probably it, now it's probably hidden beyond I/O, but then on that buff slide you you saw it, and I can share it. Uh, it definitely HD5 is uh, reading metadata just kills performance. Hmm. Hmm. I can I, I I can show you what I'm talking about, but uh, it's it is something, and the guy is talking about like get me information like H5 dump meaning. It's like John Reedy has it in JSON files, right? All mm -hmm. this typing information, reading it, uh, it is much, and parsing it is turns out much faster than HDF five, even reading from the its own structures in memory. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have that slide handy? Yeah, just give me a second. I will, I will find it. It's not find it. I just need to go to to the folder. Um, Okay, um, do you want me to share? Yeah, please. Oh, uh, let's see. Do you see which, what do you see? I see yourself. Yeah, I, see. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't need to swap uh, the displays, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's the presenter display. But, so yeah, if you switch, switch, if you switch your displays, we'll see the, just the one slide. There you go. Okay, so here's the story that um, with um, Blue Brain project, uh, they have uh, which generated synthetic data, which represents their science data, and that was 
uh, 17 uh, or 19 gigabyte file with 20,000 uh, data sets. And data sets was one dimensional and two dimensional, but they all kind of uh, the same. Uh, I don't know why. So what happens here? Here you see gray bars. It's on the system with GPFS. Gray bars represent within all data sets into memory so the application can proceed and that uh, all measurements are done three times um, and uh, hdf5 is already page the uh, page allocation and page buffer it's using those features because without this uh, it was taking hours to process the file oh i'll bet yeah so direct uh here's where interesting things comes that uh, raw data, so application discovers the, the location of raw data, and for this it discovers uh, offsets in the file where raw data is, its data type and uh, shape and size. And here you see one thread reading uh, all this metadata and organizing data structures, application data structures, uh, before multiple threads start reading from the file, uh, cycling, looping through uh, through all data sets. And uh, this is left side. And right side, the same information is read from pre-computed JSON file. And this is how it looks like. And the third set of bars is uh, slightly tuned. Uh, instead of reading raw data from the file application reads just one megabyte pages because of GPFS, it was the best option to uh, read raw data. And then it copies, since it knows location in the pages of raw data, it copies uh, raw, raw data of data sets from uh, those pages to memory structures. Once again, this is the same uh, metadata reads by the library, by one thread, finding all this information. And this is how it looks um, with JSON. So the all, uh, right, more, uh, more, uh, right bar, those three bars represent, it's the best bandwidth that they can, it's system bandwidth that they reached with this approach. Uh, of course, uh, wall connector that we will be working on will need to think how to do this, but uh, the, the, this part will be hidden behind uh, threads that will be reading metadata. So approach with uh, wall connector and um, um, multiple threading reading will definitely benefit performance. It will be at least 60% of bandwidth of the system, at least for their system. So what do you mean by read metadata using HDF5? Okay, so Please. you have APIs, H5 get type, H5 get size, H5 get uh, size of raw data. Do you remember those APIs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? And the theory, my understanding is that all this information is encoded in data set header. Mm -hmm. Right? Or computed from information from data set header. Yeah. And this is how much time takes the library to use those APIs to read through metadata of 20,000 data sets and put them in data structures in memory. This is unsurprising. Versus a JSON, the computer JSON file, which has uh, just, uh, this is your size, this is your type, this is a uh, location of the data set. Read this file, uh, parse it, populate the same structures, and then read data. So, so the JSON file is constructed by originally calling like those HDF5 files. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. A separate thing that just reads that up and then uses the uh, get uh, stuff. Uh, uh, right, right, right. So this is definitely beneficial for application that will read the same data multiple times, right? Mm -hmm. So because uh, overhead of just reading or uh, using HDF5 APIs is pretty substantial. It, it's like one third of uh, or one fourth of total execution time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this was with this speed when it was tuned by essentially they kind of implemented page buffer for GPFS here because they read by pages. Uh, the, this is how it looks uh, with multi threading. You can saturate completely the system and achieve the bandwidth. But this is what's really surprised because all data is in memory. What we're doing here, we are decoding whatever is even in metadata cache. And I don't know, one experiment that can be done 
maybe uh, one thing that I suspect what is happening, still buffer didn't contain all pages, so there was some swapping of the metadata pages was going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then most of the time to be verified was spent in decoding that information. And if application has to call it every time, you know, so it's definitely room for improvement here. Yeah, I wonder how much of that is potential page uh, page swapping and how much of that is just... Uh, uh, right, right. Uh, more, more expense is needed and it will be different for different systems, but uh, uh, th this is what... Um, uh, uh, this comes back to, you know, this was approach that I just people, right, uh, chose because they have their metadata, not in binary file, it's an XML file, which mm -hmm. is faster to process and share. So, so how is it, so when they parse this, this JSON file, uh -huh. what, 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 can, what structure are they constrained, are they constructing to, to find all the, the chunk information? Um, I would need to go back to the application. I'm, I, I, I cannot answer. We'll write down all this. Cause, cause uh, that's what really matters, right? I mean, if they basically like, if they parse this once and throw this into some sort of like, some sort of hash table that lets them just really quickly go find the chunk location, then um, that's gonna be very fast compared uh, to HDF5 which is going to basically, like everything's going to go through the metadata cache. No, it's linear JSON file with just, uh, I have examples somewhere in my email, but it's, it's it, uh, nothing fancy is there because we had two weeks to, to rock and first when we started, uh, they even couldn't, they, they were going to drop HD5 because it was taking hours to process while it takes two seconds now to process with solution we found. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if they're JSON parser, if that's what it's doing under the hood, right? Because this thing's parsing the JSON file and putting it into some data structure, then you're able to query it. Uh, so when they create it once, then they use it, right? But here, even here, you know, comparing, they were even happy with this result because it was now, you know, it was workable, but mm -hmm. we tuned it more. But the question is that clearly when you have JSON file, you're spending less time parsing it than, uh, HDF5 library in decoding information stored in the headers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. I think it's very exciting. We can improve performance greatly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like HDF5 being like its own self contained thing, though, I mean, this is talking about like having out of band storage for something. Oh, but you see, HDF5 has, for example, this user block, right? You can stack that uh, file, JSON file, as a header. Right, but, but whether you glom it on there or not, it's external storage, right? Like it's it's some other thing that is not native to the HDF5 library, right? You'd have to, I mean, essentially, I mean, if if the library were aware of this, right, then you could have like, <coughs> potentially you could have like a, Instead of using the metadata cache, if you wanted to, you could like you could come up with some other way of dealing with metadata, right? Like you could take that JSON file, you could pack that down to some binary metadata thing that we stick in the file, and you could repack it and just be like, hey, this is like some big blob. This file is not going to be changed. We're not going to update this at all. Just slap it here, and then that's that's what you use now to go get your data. Uh, and if that's faster. Then, uh, then, as I said, we do not know from where yeah. Sloan has come. It needs to be investigated. I'm, I was surprised, uh, frankly speaking, because at first I thought they did parsing in parallel because the structure of the file allows you to multiple threads to analyze it in parallel, but it was sequential, one thread. But you know, it also may be that, like, you know, having a metadata cache and the way that the metadata cache behaves is very heavyweight. Right, and that we should consider replacing that with something that is much more lightweight and 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 also easier to maintain. Right, there's a lot of complexity in the metadata cache, and you know, it behaves well. We don't really have bugs in the metadata cache, um, but but it, it's potentially it's a lot of it's a lot of work maintaining all those lists. We've we've had significant performance gains. I mean, not not I would say significant, but we've had performance gains from switching some of the data structures. Um, and uh, 
in, in the many of the cash. So, so that suggests that like that is a non-trivial amount. So I'm not surprised by those bars on the top, right? Even if it is just like getting stuff out of the, the page buffer in memory, like that, just maintaining all those lists and kicking stuff in and out of the, the main data cache and where it's tracking it is, is non-trivial overhead. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we might want to investigate for, for the future. Yeah, the, I, I feel like the, the metadata in, in HDFI file is kind of um, structured. To, is it, it was designed to be tiny, right? And so that's like how to, that, and that's why their performance was terrible, right? Because if you don't aggregate stuff, yeah, yeah it gets scattered all over the place. And that's like the worst for IO. And so, you know, we can, we can potentially kick that can even further in the direction of, of aggregation and, and pulling stuff up. Remember, HD5 was designed for few big data sets, not oh, for yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, the use cases have changed, the computers have changed, right? I mean, like the, the average, I mean, how much metadata is in some of these files, right? Like, you know, even when you have large files, the metadata is often definitely something that can fit into to memory. Actually, in the, in this in this case, it was um, six megabytes comparing to seventeen gigabyte file. So yeah, this is another thing, right? It should all be in buffer, in my phone, buffer. right? So like, I mean, six megabytes is not that's a picture on my phone. It's so tiny, right? Like, so right. who cares, right? So if we can, if we have a data structure that can be managed by some alternative system that isn't the metadata cache. Because you don't want to re-architect the library. I mean, that that idea that like there's a thing that gets metadata, that's fine. But like, but if the thing that gets metadata and stores it is a dramatically, if there's an alternative one that's a dramatically simplified cache that just reads like a big chunked thing that's like a big blob on the on the disk, that's like way better, right? Like you know, just read it all at once, drop the read head, you know, slurp up your six or twelve or twenty megabytes or whatever, and then just leave it hanging out in memory, and then accesses would be really fast instead of having like all this like lists and blah 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 other stuff especially for the for the case where you're just reading right like a lot of data is, is worm right is read write once read many and so you're never going to change it again so if you're just doing the the read case you don't have to worry about like dirty lists or any of that other junk right just slurp it up and throw it in a key value store that we embed right mm -hmm. of whatever type and so, so that there, there may be different, definitely better ways of, of handling a lot of this, this stuff. So yeah, that was really nice. nice discussion. How much time do we have here? What time? This this ends at a, a funny time now. Is it the uh, two was, minutes? We got ten minutes. Okay. Oh, actually, two, wait. It's two, two minutes. Two <laughs> minutes. So we have time for any any quick questions? Any two minute questions? Uh, Dana, I just had a quick question. You had sure. uh, you had originally posted, I think it was a, a timeline schedule of the different releases. Uh, yes. Can you repost that or let me know or in the chat oh, maybe always, where, where that is? It's always on GitHub. It's always yeah. on the GitHub yeah, site. Okay. I always, if you just go to, let me, let me grab it. Actually, you know what, I'll, I'll share. Let me grab a window. Oops. Let me up. We'll just do this real quick. Here's do five. And then let's see here. Share screen, grab this window here. All right, and so you guys should be looking at this window when it's scrolling. Yes, got it. Oh, great, okay. So if we just go to the bottom here, this is always up to date. Oh, very good, very right? good. I mean, as I said, like you know, the, this this 110 that is here, let me make this bigger for, you know, um, this this 11010 and this 1141, yeah, that's kind of science fiction. I have no idea exactly when that's going to come out because um, it's going to really depend on kind of what happens in development land over the next couple of months. Um, because there's like, there, we have customers that are kind of keen on seeing some of the performance stuff that we did over the summer in, into 11010. So this may come out a little earlier. Uh, 1141 is going to depend on what kind of features we get into it. Um, like, you know, for example, what if we have like some of these other things that we are thinking of putting in, but VFD Storm takes a little longer. It might be that there's a 114.1 here and a 114.2 that's a little later in the year. So we'll see, right? Depends on um, on, on things. But but these two here, this 1.8.23 and this 1.12.3, these I know will happen in January and February. Those are, we're we're keen on on dropping those because we, we, have, we have too many branches to support. Okay. So, and did you say the 114 was coming out 
early? Is, no, is that, that's, that's on schedule. I mean, like, oh, that's on schedule. I, okay. Yeah, I always, I always draw these in here just that the diamonds kind of line up nice with the months. I draw it at the end of the month. Plus, that gives me the most time to fudge. Okay. And so, um, but I, I don't want to. I, I, I hesitate to release anything close to Christmas because then all the people who can answer questions evaporate, and then if there is a problem, right? You know, we, we'd have nobody to talk to. So, so even the sixteenth to me is close to cutting it too close to Christmas, but. Um, yeah, so so yeah, so the final release is the we're creating the branch in a couple of days on Thursday, and then a week after that on Friday is when we release it. Okay, okay, thank you. I don't, I don't think those dates are going to move. And then once that releases in 2023, I'll update all this again. Okay, thank you. Got it. Well, thanks everybody for coming. And when you're dropping um, auto tools? Uh, you know, I'm not, the, you know, the, the thing about the auto tools, so at first I was very bullish on getting rid of the auto tools. I, I do not like having to maintain two build systems. I want everything to be shoved into one build system and then all our expertise goes there. That's the one that everybody cares about. And I don't have to worry about, are they in sync and all that other stuff? Because that's, that's annoying and a nightmare. But the, the thing that gives me pause about dropping the auto tools is which would not be dropped until 2.0 and 1.14 and earlier would always have the auto tools. We would never drop them there. Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah. I would never, I, I won't inflict that level of pain on, on users. I expect people to upgrade. Um, but the, the, the thing that, that, that gave me pause in that whole conversation, you know, people who are like, ah, CMake, I don't like it. Like, whatever, right? Like, people get over that. It's, it's, for, I, I'm not, I'm less a fan of CMake. I like the auto tools better in some ways. Um, I understand why CMake is better in other ways, but it, in terms of use, like to me, like, you know, typing a configure line versus typing CC make is, yeah, it's the same really, right? Like that's, it, especially if you're just building like one thing. But the, the thing that, that gave me pause is R, is if the R community really has trouble with it. Like, I don't want to alienate an important community right. because of our lack of support of something that they care about. Right. Um, and people point out that MPitch is always going to be like an auto tools shop for forever that they're never going to do CMake. But the auto tools and CMake can interoperate, right? Like they don't have to, you don't have to have entirely a CMake build chain. You can still use that stuff, just a matter of which are discoverable by the other system. You know, one thing for CMake for me, it is so messy that debugging where errors are, all this mess that goes in one build directory and testing, it's insane. You really have to know everything to find what is going wrong. With auto tools, output is much, much cleaner. So if CMake output and structure of binaries and where tests are can be cleaner, um, fine. But yeah. no, right now it's a huge mess. CMake is not the thing for big libraries like ours. That's my personal opinion. And I'm fine with CMake, but it should be cleaned then substantially because right now it's, it's a huge mess that dropped on you don't develop as lab. So, so two things. One, yes, right? Like, yes, the, the CMake stuff is definitely, it's messier and it changes way faster than I'm comfortable with, right? I'm not a big fan. Like, let me just on the CMake side and also just internally for our stuff, like the CMake stuff seems to change with the breeze and I would like for that to settle down, mm -hmm. but it's hard to because the CMake people keep coming out with useful features and then we want to incorporate those. So, you know, we're constantly ticking the, the required version up. And so to me, that's just, it's it's much less stable than the auto tools, which are like the same for like, a, I mean, like I think they, they recently had a version that released like two years ago. And before that, the previous version, like 269 was like from 2012, right? So it's like this long history that they, they keep around. But I'd say the other thing is that like, when, when you say that like, ah, it's confusing and all stuff's in different places, the auto tools are equally confusing. We're just used to it more, right? Like, and to me, that's why I prefer the auto tools because I'm used to their crazy, right? Like I grew up with the auto tools. And so I, you know, when, when the auto tools do weird stuff, I like, I know what it's going to, what it's doing under the hood. But if you try to talk to people about like all the doofy macros and like, if you're trying to debug and you haven't installed stuff yet, you have to know to run lib tool dash dash mode equals execute right because if you don't you're running the shell script right that is a thing and so like valgrin gets sad and there's like all this like weird stuff that you'd have to kind of know that you don't have to know with cmake because cmake just built the binary right it's just there there's, there's no lib yeah. tool 
script that runs it, right? So it's just like, I, I think both build systems are, are equally bad, right? It's just a matter of picking, like, I just want to have one bad build system instead of two uh, bad build systems. You know, I don't think they're bad. They, they should be used in the proper manner. That's what I'm saying. I, and I think Auto that, Tools is used in better organized manner than CMake. That's it. I, I, I just, I feel like that there's like, it, it's trying to solve a complicated problem. And so all the abstractions leak at a certain point and have sharp edges that people trip over. And so it's, 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 you know, because they're trying to, they're trying to make a, a unified thing that works across a large number of platforms. So they're trying to abstract away kind of like how libraries get loaded and stuff like that. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's complicated and awkward, I think, at, at any, mm -hmm. any level. But that, that's why, that's why I think it's useful for us to, to settle on one. Right, which I, I mean, it can't be the auto tools, unfortunately, because the, the auto tools are really limited to pod 60 systems. But to just have one, like you only really need one, one blob of institutional knowledge, right? And then everybody gets used to it and that just becomes a thing. Whereas instead now we have kind of two camps. There's people who do auto tool stuff and there's people who do CMake stuff. And when one is screwing up, you really need a developer from that camp to go in and fix it. It just, it makes everything so much easier if it's just one thing. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish it could be the auto tools. I think the auto tools, like in some ways are, are kind of easier, but maybe for me anyway, I mean, just because that's what I grew up with. I did not grow up with CMake. I find a lot of the CMake stuff totally baroque, but I, I do agree that like it, the stuff needs to be better organized. I don't like how it dumps, like for me to go like dig around in the CMake output to find like where it hiccuped and like, it's so, yeah, it's just, it's crazy, right? Like it's, it's much easier. The auto tools just, it mirrors the directory structure of what I made, the way that we set it up. So it's easy. Like it's, I, I find it easier to, to, to deal with mm -hmm. personally. Me too. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm sad. I, I wish we could keep that, but, but we have to support Windows. Right. Uh, you you have communities, so you may ask for community help. To otherwise, it will be dropped. So, yeah. Well, I mean, for for right now, I'm gonna leave it alone. I mean, it's not something that we have to drop in the, in the immediate future. It's not that big of a deal, right? Like we can carry it going forward into 2.0, and then you know, maybe people change their mind in a year. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, CMake, I think, has gotten much more traction in the past couple of years than it has in the past. I mean, SPAC drives it a lot, at least on the ECP side. So. There's, there's there's reasons to think that CMake is eventually going to be the winner if we just wait long enough. So we'll see. Anyway, I have other meetings, so <laughs> thank you for all com for coming. And yeah, look for for 114. And if you have any questions about it, let us know. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.